We're talking Montreal Expos with former Expos beat writer Danny Gallagher, the man who has written nine books on the Expos, Joe Tilly's great Canadian sports show. Come on up! Our guest today grew up in Renfro, Ontario, five decades as a sports writer, now calls Oshawa home, a former Expos beat writer, covered the Blue Jays. He worked for the Montreal Daily News, the Ottawa Sun, and the Globe and Mail. He has authored 12 books, nine of them on the Expos. Welcome to the program, Danny Gallagher. Danny, good to see you, my friend. I look at Joe. It's always a pleasure being on the air with you. You've always been supportive of all my book projects. Well, Danny, you've done some great work, and I want to thank you for that. First of all, I want to get back to the, the beginning. First of all, how did you become a reporter, and, and how did you end up covering the Expos? Well, I graduated from uh, Loyalist College in Belleville, Ontario, with a communication arts course, they called it, uh, which included writing journalism and broadcast journalism, and photography. And then uh, in June of 1972, I got my first job as a weekly newspaper in Ottawa with the Ottawa Nepean Clarion. And then eventually I worked my way into the daily newspaper business and uh, Sudbury, Ottawa, Regina. And then when I was in Regina, I was on the uh, Regina Pats uh, hockey beat. And then I was communicating with the people who were putting together the new Montreal Daily News uh, newspaper, and they uh, saw fit to hire me in March of 1988. So that's when I uh, got on the beat about two or three weeks, uh, two or three months later, uh, covering the Expos. So I've been covering the Expos, uh, whether it's in book form or in the newspaper business or online, since 1988, even though, Joe, I grew up, uh, you know, following the Expos and going to a lot of games uh, when I was in Ottawa. Yeah, so you uh, following, becoming an Expos reporter after being an Expos fan, was that like a dream, dream come true for you? Oh, for sure. To get on the Expos beat uh, was really something uh, to, you know, get to know guys like... Uh, Wallach and Reigns and Dennis Martinez and Buck Rogers, the manager. It was really a thrill to get on the beat and cover all the home games and do a lot of the road trips. And uh, so I always say that if I was never on the Expos beat, that I wouldn't be writing all of these Expos books, Joe. Uh, even though I've been a fan before 1980, I, I would never have... Uh, Started writing these books. You've written nine books on the Expos. That's a lot. And now the latest, of course, is uh, this one here, Around the Corn, Around the Horn. Uh, with This is uh, uh, Cash, Boots, Duke, Gully, and the Expos. Uh, what prompted this particular book for you? See, what I've been doing uh, in recent years is this is the fifth uh, this is actually the fourth year, next year is another book, but th this is the fourth consecutive year that I've been writing a series of books, uh, vignettes I call them, as chapters, small and short vignettes on certain players and events from 1969 to 2004. So 2020, Joe, was that first book, then 21, 22, 23. Uh, so... This is the fourth one in a row. So what I'm doing is, is getting a hold of uh, different players that I don't have in my previous books, whether they're part-time players or full-time players or star players. I really like the part-time players as much as the full-time because they contributed a lot to the success of, of the ball team. So it doesn't have to be a star, obviously, as you mentioned, to make your book. It's some of the part-time players, players, I guess, that uh, have piqued your interest through the years. 
this particular book, uh, one of the one of the subjects is, is Dave Van Horn, who was there with the Expos from day one. Uh, let, talk about that very first game uh, at Shea Stadium. And uh, we have a pick, I think, of, of Dave with uh, Charles Bromfin right here. Uh, talk about that first game at Shea Stadium. What was that like? I know that the Canadian anthem left Van Horn's broadcast partner, Russ Taylor, in tears. Talk about that uh, uh, that first game. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like the Charles Bronfman was in tears at that game as well. He was the original, I guess, majority owner of the Expo, even though he had a lot of um, minority shareholders under him. And to get that franchise, um, it was simply called the Montreal Baseball Club. And it, for a while, for a number of months, the Expo name did not come into existence. That name came in in January of 1969, but Charles and his team had been putting together the all the people, the employees, the scouts, and the players to participate in 1969. And that first game, it was a very emotional uh, game. I guess more forced to deliver the the national anthem, and then Charles was in tears, and John McHale. And Jim Fanning was there, and they would have been in tears. And it's a very emotional thing. This is the first time that Major League Baseball had come to Canada. So it was quite a, a pioneering thing for Charles Brockman and his team. So why, why the Expos? Why did they come up with that particular name? I mean, I'm not sure uh, I like it was after the Expo 67, right? Uh, Expo 67, which you know, took place in 1967. So they figured they'd go on that theme of the World's Fair. It was a big name, a big event, and that's how that name came forth. Now, um, as you'll see the, <laughs> the logo on my shirt, people ask about the, where did that logo come from? Well, I'm, Charles Brockman told me it stands for, and then you'll see, Montreal Baseball Club. Somehow in there you'll see the M, you'll see the B, and you'll see the C. The C, I guess, is the red. So that's how that logo came forth. Okay, so C, B, L. Tell me, what, yeah. how does that say Montreal Baseball? How does that say Montreal Baseball? Oh, I know, baseball, yeah. Yeah. Montreal Baseball Club. That C is just kind of kind of a stylized C, but the, that's what Charles told me. Some people try to say that Charles Brockman put that logo into as part of his initial CB, but he denies that. It every time I okay. bring that up to him, he says, "No, that's not it. That's no. I didn't do that for Charles Brockman. I did it for somebody to do a logo for me." Montreal Baseball Club. Well, you know, it's it's an iconic logo, no doubt about that. And it brings back a lot of cool memories for me every time I see it. You know, when we're reading your book, I didn't realize that Tom Cheek, former Jays broadcaster, had called some Expos games before he called the, called the Jays. Tell us about that. That's right. He, uh, that was like uh, in the 70s. Yeah. In the 70s, before he went to the Blue Jays in 77, he did one or two years uh, alongside Dave Van Horn. So he had his, his start in the major leagues uh, with the Expos, even though he's more well-known for his long time with the Blue Jays before he died. So he cut his teeth in Montreal. Interesting. So uh, we have one of the one of the greatest calls that Dave Van Horn ever made uh, one of the greatest calls, actually one of the greatest moments in Expos baseball history. Uh, let, let's roll that. Uh, it was Dennis Martinez. Six in a row have been retired by Dennis Martinez. One and two pitch. In the air. Center field. Grissom. That's beautiful. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was it, man. What I want to call that was El Presidente, El Perfecto, and what a moment that was. You know what the what Dave Van Horn told me several times is that when he when he said El Presidente, El Perfecto, he did not say anything else probably for maybe two or three minutes. He wanted the the fan noise in the background. He wanted the the players on the field uh, getting around uh, Dennis. So he just didn't say a word. Him and Ken Singleton did not say a word for maybe two minutes. You know, and you see Dennis Martinez there, and he's so emotional. I mean, a lot of players on that field are emotional. I, I'm feeling emotional watching it now. Um, you know, and because the, the Expos had a lot, and you mentioned this in your book, they had a lot of reclamation projects like Dennis Martinez, like Dennis Oil Ken Boyd. Tim Raines, Otis Nixon. Uh, did that, the fact that they had an open mind, they were willing to give players a second chance, how did that serve them? Did that serve them well? Yeah, they, uh, they've had a lot of success with the, uh, you know, people who've had drinking and drug problems. And Dennis Martinez was one of them, Oil Can Boy, Pascal Perez, uh, Tim Raines, uh, you know, he had his problems uh, for one year in 82. So, They've had, they've had a lot of success. They've had what they had was sympathy for these players who had their problems. And they decided, okay, we're going to give these guys a, a, a second chance. And as it turned out, uh, it, it turned out pretty good for all of those guys. Yeah, perfect game. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, one of the stories in your book, it, 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 well, a few stories about Danny Plamond. The Bat Boy, and I believe we have a, a, a picture of Danny Plamond and the Bat Boy. Here we go. Uh, he had a few scoops for you, um, like the time that uh, Charlie Fox punched Steve Rogers in the face. And that was uh, something that no, nobody ever heard that story until uh, Danny told you, shared that story with you. Yeah, well, he, Danny had a lot of say and knowledge of what was going on in the clubhouse. He was like a reporter almost. <laughs> so he heard in the background that Steve Rogers said to Charlie Fox, smart Charlie, meaning that did not make any sense, but he, he shouldn't do that. Because Charlie Fox was after Chris Spire because Spire was in a hitting slump and he was Charlie Fox was bugging him and bugging him for like four or five minutes in the clubhouse, giving him a hard time. And yeah. uh, Steve Rogers intervened, and and Charlie Fox hauled off and popped him in the face and knocked him down. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty crazy stuff. So there was no repercussions for that? Nobody uh, – I mean, Steve Rogers was a star of the club, and, and – uh, you know, Charlie Fox wasn't, so I would think there might be some repercussions or did nobody find out about that? Yeah. Well, later on that winter, Joe, the Expos, John McHale decided that uh, Charlie Fox would no longer be managing because of that situation. That was one of the, the situations that prompted John McHale, I'm going to be the general manager myself. So Charlie Fox, he stayed with the organization for another few years as a special advisor to John McHale. So he wasn't, you know, he wasn't let go right away. But after, that happened in July of 1978. So Charlie Fox stayed the rest of the season as general manager. But even, uh, this was in another book, Charlie Fox's son uh, disapproved of what his father did to Steve Rogers. He said that, right. said that's a no-no. Right. Yeah, no doubt about that. So uh, uh, I think that's safe to say that's a no-no. You don't, you don't, you don't punch a star player in the face. You don't punch anybody in the face, probably. But you know, certainly that's the case. So I want to talk a little bit about Gary Carter. So uh, you know, promising that kid that had cancer that he was going to hit a home uh, run for him, and he did. And and you mentioned you talked about that in your book. Uh, uh, how popular was a, of a player was Gary Carter within the team, and and of course with the fans. Uh, yeah. So, what is that question again, Joe? Sorry. How how popular of a player was Gary Carter in terms of you know teammates and and the fans? 
Yeah, he was really very, very popular uh, with the fans because he was smiling. He always did a lot of autographs. He was really beloved by the fans in Montreal. You know, to be honest, some of the players did not like Carter that much because he was smiling all the time and he was always on camera and doing interviews. And and uh, so Warren Kamadi nicknamed him Camera because he was <laughs> you know, always doing uh, interviews and smiling. And they didn't think that that kind of like Carter that much for uh, so there were some players that didn't like him. It was, you know, the good and the bad. You know, the, the fans liked him, but the some of the players didn't like him. Right. And you mentioned, I think, somebody else called him Teeth, I believe, <laughs> as well. <laughs> because yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, but we have something here. It, it's, um, for a brief period of time, Gary Carter was the highest paid athlete on the planet. Uh, he did well with the endorsements and we, we actually had his longtime agent, Jerry Petrie on the show a while back. Let's roll uh, that clip. Vic. Shooting now. I'm glad because they'll probably have that in there. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but anyways, uh, we got an eight o'clock uh, limousine picking us up, taking us out to Adams Brands. We're going to do an audio visual presentation. And then the next day, of course, is, uh, is you're doing a seven up seven appearance up. Yeah. in Toronto. And then you can fly. Oh, the script. Did you did you read that? The, for the I, I read over it briefly. Um, the the thing that you know might be a little bit of trouble is is the French. Um, you know, I read over it a little bit. A long time. A long time. Uh, uh, long long time. Avec les expos de Montréal. You create the people knocking on our door, and then we'll look at it from look after it from there, making sure that you're doing everything. We'll guide you in the right areas. Be with the right products, be with the right corporations, be with the right people, so that, uh, you know, that the thing that you've built over all these years, the smile, the wholesomeness, the, the all apple pie and motherhood and all that, but all of that is never, ever uh, taken away from you because you're with in, in bad company. What you saw there was our philosophy. Number one, um, Bellevue, what, what, why Jean, Gordy Howe, all these guys came to us um, basically through the fact that we would make them money outside of their sport. Uh, we saw Jerry, Str uh, I mean, we saw Gary struggling a little bit with the French part of it. Uh, was that a problem for, for some of the players? Yeah, I think that he, he um, enjoyed talking. Sometimes he tried to talk in French and, uh, he was certainly a, a tremendous player, even though some of the players didn't like, obviously, he was one of the best players in franchise history, playing, you know, the dirtiest position on the team, being a catcher, strapping on all the equipment and getting foul balls in the chest and on the shoulders and his hands. And he was certainly one of the top five players in, you know, Expo's franchise history. Uh, I think that Dawson, you know, Guerrero, maybe the top two players, and then, you know, Tim Raines, and then uh, Steve Rogers, uh, some really great players uh, passed through the uh, Expos chain. Yeah, you talk about, you mentioned Dawson, and uh, obviously another great, another great player. Uh, the Hawk was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2013, and uh, he was pretty grateful when that happened. Let's, let's roll that clip, Vic. Thank you to the Montreal Expos organization for drafting me and giving me my start. You gave me my first 10 years in the major leagues, the experience of a new culture, and playing across the border. Thank you, Expos fans, for your kindness and your admiration. My mom was everything to me. And while she's not here, she is still with me. I hope she looks down and she is proud of me. I love you, Mom. How big was the hawk in Montreal? Yeah, he, he played with a lot of courage 
and bravery because his knees weren't exactly the greatest. He'd have to, the knees taped up before games, and but he never made that an excuse. He went out there and played 150%. He was a five-tool player. He could run, he could field, he could hit for power, he could throw. He was really an excellent example, a role model for for the way he carried himself uh, hitting and throwing and fielding. A good example for people to put out, even though you may have your problem with the knees and the pain. He was really an exceptional athlete and person. And even to this day, or well, maybe once a month, I might text him and see how he's doing and or run something by him for one of my books. And always so cooperative and a comedy. Yeah. I loved watching him play. No doubt about that. So uh, a few years ago, you wrote the book uh, Blue Monday, uh, October 19th, 1981, the NLCS against the Dodgers, the Expos only playoff appearance, game five, all tied up in the top of the ninth with Jay's ace, Steve Rogers on the hill. And uh, we had an unlikely hero, I think, for the visitors. Let's get the call of that famous play. Now in the stretch. Here's the 3-1 pitch. And it's swung on. Fly ball. Center field. Dawson going back onto the warning track. Dawson at the wall. That ball is a home run. That ball is out of here. And a home run for Rick Monday. And the Dodger bench clears to congratulate Rick Monday, who has hit a two-out home run here in the ninth inning. And it appeared that Andre Dawson had room as he went back to the fence. And he just flat ran out of room as the ball cleared the fence. At about the 385 mark. Uh, crushing blow. You know, I, I remember watching that. Uh, <laughs> I think I was at the mall uh, just outside school, University of Alberta, and uh, they had, a, had the TVs on, and uh, it was just a crushing blow. And, uh, wow. And, 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 you know, it kind of changed the fortunes of the team in, in a lot of ways, didn't it? Yeah, you know, they had some good stretch of teams from 79 to 83 where they had some great teams. It's almost like a mini dynasty, even though they only made the playoffs in 81. And then 82, they also a really, really good team, and they didn't win it. And then 83, you know, another team that probably should have won it. And then when Gary Carter was traded after the 84 season, it was a new uh, regime almost that came into the Expos. Murray Cook became the general manager. Buck Rogers was the new manager. And it was a new kind of an era. And I always like to think from 85 to on, the fan support for the Expos really went downhill, plus the caliber of the teams kind of went down too, even though they had a surprise team in 87. And then 89, when I was there, they should have won that National East in 1989. They folded, and they finished up with 81 and 81. And then that's when Charles Groffin decided, I'm putting my team up for sale. So uh, Dan Duquette came back, came in, and he had bringing Gary Carter back. Was he a how good a uh, GM was Dan was Duquette? Yeah, Dan Duquette was a really innovative uh, general manager who who had to work in difficult circumstances in terms of a limited payroll because the new consortium of Owners under Claude Bouchou had very little money. Claude Bouchou himself had very little money. So Dan Duquette had to operate within a small payroll. And to bring back uh, Gary Carter was really a great move for the franchise to bring the past to the present. And uh, certainly that was a great move that uh, really uh, vital revitalized the, uh, the Expos as well as... Uh, 
Jan Duquette uh, hiring Felipe Alou as manager midway through the 1992 season, and that rejuvenated the franchise as well. And Dan Duquette put together some great players through the trade market and free agency to put together some great teams in 93 and 94. There were great ball teams. They almost won in 93, and everybody knows that the mm-hmm. strike uh, screwed things up in 94. Yeah, they were so close in in '94, of course, and then the strike ruined everything. They were the best team in baseball that that season, and uh, might have won, won a World Series, might have won that only World Series. Um, but I wanted to I, you know, go back a, a little bit. You you uh, in your book Blue Monday, you talk about uh, you know Rick Monday, and he told you about his run in with Johnny Padres, uh, and that was an interesting uh, situation. Tell about tell us about Rick Monday and uh, Johnny Padres. Well, yeah, Johnny Padres was a uh, a Dodgers player, pitcher, you know, for many years ago. And Rick Mundy was a kid who, uh, after a game, went down near the Dodgers uh, bus and asked Johnny Padres for an autograph. And Johnny Padres said, no, I'm, I'm not doing any autographs. So Rick Mundy was very, very... Embarrassed, he is one of his Johnny Padres was one of his heroes, and then many many years later, he ran into Johnny Padres, I guess, at some Dodgers alumni function, and uh, Rick Mundy brought it up and <laughs> told Johnny Padres this is what happened years ago. Uh, so they kind of patched things up and they became friends after that. But that first initial meeting didn't go very good. You know, it, it's a reminder to all players, hey, sign those balls, sign those jerseys, sign whatever you they can ask you to sign because they could come back to bite you, right? So uh, uh, you, what would you say is the greatest disappointment? I mean, the fact that the Expos didn't get to play in that 94 World Series, is that the – was that – what is the greatest uh, significant, most significant uh, – I guess, uh, scenario that led to finally their demise? Well, I guess it would be the aftermath of the 94 season, Joe, in April of 1995, when the Claude Rochu, the managing general partner of the Expos, told Kevin Malone, we we don't, we have very little money. We went through the whole off season. We didn't sell any season tickets because the strike was still on that whole winter of 94, 95. So he made, Claude Bouchou made the decision, we can't offer a contract to Larry Walker, and we got to trade Marquise Grissom, John Wetland, and Ken Hill. Wow. Those four key players hmm. uh, gone from the team, and that was a real disaster to have to get rid of those guys. And, uh, and what they got in return for Hill, Wetland, and Bisson was very little. It was uh, pretty pathetic. So that was like the kind of the downhill for the Expos was after the disaster of 94 when they couldn't get into the playoffs and finish that season because the playoffs would have brought a, a lot of revenue into the Expos' coffers and would have allowed them to keep some of those players uh, for another few years uh, without having to trade anybody. But since they had no money in season ticket sales for the winter of 94-95, the brochure made a decision we have to get rid of some of them. And some people said, well, why not maybe keep one or two of those guys instead of uh, getting rid of all of them, but Claude wanted to get rid of all of them. So from there on... Uh, the team, you know, they had some good half decent teams in 96 and then 2003. But uh, from 95 on, the, the fan support was, really wasn't that great. Um, is there any chance the Expos ever return? <laughs> it's going to take somebody with a lot of money. Um, Stephen Brockman, Charles Brockman's son, uh, has pretty much indicated that 
he's not interested in a team that plays 162 games. Uh, he was interested in that part-time concept with Tampa Bay, the split season where they play maybe 40 mm. games in uh, Montreal, but to play 81 home games and then 162 games with a full-time team, they were not interested in that because it was obviously too expensive. Plus, they have to get a new ballpark. They'd have to big, play a big expansion fee, whatever that is, a, mil, a billion or more. So, unless, you know, he can get a number of high-priced corporations to help him out, or if somebody else wants to come in and, and put in a bid for a franchise, it looks kind of gloomy at this point. So you see from 2012 to, to 20, 2022, there was a lot of passion for baseball with because of Warren Commodity's work in, in pushing and pushing for an expansion franchise. Like from 2004 to 2012, there's basically no interest in anybody trying to bring back a team. You know, how big of a role do you think Jeffrey Loria played in this Expo's demise? I know you don't speak very highly of Jeffrey. It's funny. I just did a story, maybe you noticed uh, for the Montreal Gazette, a few days ago about what Loria said in his new book. It's called From, From the Front Row, where he talks in part about his time with the Expo. Like it's 40% art dealership that he is and 50% of, of the Marlins baseball team. And he spends about 10% mm -hmm. on the Expos. And all of that part about the Expos is about dealing with the limited partners who didn't want to put up any money to uh, help Loria pay the salaries of, of the players and the employees and the scouts and so on. So he ended up as the, the main uh, shareholder holding what, about 90% because the limited partner didn't want to pony up with extra money. But, you know, he, in a way, he's right because the limited partner did want to, they, they put up an initial five to 10 million bucks or something as part of a corporation, whether it's Loblaws or Provigo or Bell Canada. But after a while, they didn't want to put in any extra money. So the lawyer said, well, okay, and then that means I have to take over the majority share of the team. And then when he sold uh, the team in January of 2002 to Major League Baseball, what he did, he came into the Expo's offices and he had crews taking, taking out the computers and a lot of other stuff, and he took Expo's employees with him to uh, Florida, so that's one thing that didn't go down too good with uh, people. They didn't like their lawyer. And then, you know, he took, well, Dave Van Horn maybe is a different thing. He wanted to leave because he didn't think the situation was that good in, in Montreal. So he went with, he was part of the crew, I guess, that went to Miami with the, with the Jeffrey lawyer. But, Jeffrey Lawyer does not have a uh, good reputation in the media in Montreal with the fans. Uh, I think in a lot of my books, I called him a, a shyster. But uh, I have, you know, I don't really like Jeffrey Lawyer. I like Claude Boucher, his predecessor, more than the Lawyer. I, I, I'm still in contact with Claude Boucher. I think that Claude Bouchou, after he took over from Charles Wappen, kind of saved the Expos franchise from going to the U.S. because he had to do so much hard work in getting together that consortium to, of 10 corporations or individuals to keep the team in Montreal. But yes, uh, Loria is, is not that well liked in Montreal. Well, and also he ended up getting a sweetheart deal with Major League Baseball, which made you wonder if, if this some of this hadn't been in the works already, right? Well, he bought the he sold the team what for hundred and twelve million to Major League Baseball and then he bought the Marlins for something like hundred and fifty eight million. 
that he sold a few years ago for $1.2 billion. He sure made a good, a uh, lot of bucks on that deal. Yeah, he, he sold out for very little money, and then he, he sold for over a billion dollars. Wow. So, okay, if you're a, if you're a betting man, do you uh, bet that the uh, that Montreal gets a, a baseball team in the future or not? Uh, I would say it's about 65-35. I think it's about 65% against and maybe the possibility of a 35% chance. So to me, it looks bleak, but when Rob Manfred... Uh, puts the call out for bids for new franchises in a few years. You never know. You may have somebody from Montreal with a lot of different investors put together uh, an investor group. And you, you never know. They may put a, a bid in. But right now, it looks kind of bleak, Joe. And Stephen Bobman or anybody else who might be interested, they're not saying anything. So right now that I know of, Salt Lake City, Nashville, and Portland, Oregon have groups together ready to put a bid in. They're ready to to field a baseball team, Major League Baseball team. And Charlotte does not have any any group so far. That's another city that has been bandied about as a possible franchise. So Charlotte and Montreal at this point I show no interest in uh, a franchise. Yeah, so I'd say that doesn't sound very good at all. <laughs> so I, I just want to ask you quickly about uh, Canada's other major league team, the one that's still around. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Blue Jays, where they're at, and uh, what are their shot? What's their shot of making the playoffs? Yeah, you know, I've, I've been a Blue Jays fan since 1977. I've always followed them, really enjoyed them. They've been really up and down this year. Dude. Some of the players just not performing. Vladdy is not up to par. Sometimes the pitching. Actually, the bullpen is not kind of up and down, but the starting pitching has been fairly good, except for Alex uh, Manoa. He just Manoa, has yeah. been uh, having a difficult year. And then the, the offense has been up and down. It's... Uh, I'm hoping that they still make the playoffs. I think they're they're pretty close to a wild card spot right now. So I think that they'll they'll carry it through and, and be pretty close to a wild card spot at the end of the season. Yeah, I, I if they make the playoffs, it could cause other teams a lot of trouble because their pitching's pretty strong, you know. And of course, as you know, come playoff time, that's vital. But what's that, what's that again, Mitchell? Well, if they make the playoffs, they're going to give a lot of teams trouble because their pitching is so strong. And as you know, come playoff time, pitching is you know vital. Yeah, yeah, for sure. They get in the playoffs. They got some great starters. They're really experienced starters. And who knows? It'd be nice. If Manoa came back, and then he was strong like he was in 2022. So when you get into the playoffs, uh, anything can happen, and they can cause some damage with their pitching and. The offense, and I think the bullpen is is getting a lot better than it was. Yeah, Gosman and Barrios and Kikuchi, and I'd, I'd say Manoa in the bullpen might be a good uh, a good fit. You know, if he if he comes back and has something left, right? Yeah, you know his problem this year, he could never throw enough strikes. He was throwing too many balls. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh huh. That's a problem for a pitcher. What's the best advice you've ever received? Oh, to be... That's a good question. I guess to be... To keep being positive and keep going and showing energy and enthusiasm and passion for your subject, which is baseball especially the expos so that's what i that's my 
the theory I've been uh, being positive and showing a lot of passion for what you do. Well, that you have, that you have. Once again, here's the book. Around the Horn, Cash, Boots, Duke, Gully, and the Expos. The author is Danny Gallagher. Danny, it's been great having you on the show and catching up. And uh, good luck with the book. Look at Joe. It's always a pleasure talking baseball, the Expos, and the Blue Jays. And having the support of you, Joe, you've been a long-time broadcaster for many years. You're just a really classy individual. All right, buddy. Thank you so much. More sports when we come back. My Woodbine Swiss pick of the week. Last week, I took the number two horse, Lake the King, in Thursday's sixth race, Woodbine, a $114,000 purse over a mile and one-eighth on the Tapita. Looked like a possibility that she might press for the lead, but it was more court with Christopher Husbands aboard, finding that extra push down the stretch, taking the lead, cruising to victory for trainer Lane Guilford and Chiefs Wood Stables. The 435 track returned $156.40. This week, I'm heading out to Mohawk for some harness racing. Saturday night, $600,000 final of the Canadian Pacing Derby by the missile. Was very impressive in the eliminations, romping to victory in 147-3. and three. Line Drive Hanover and Tattoo Artist both look strong in the other eliminator, so that's my exactor and triactor. Go to woodbine.com for the latest racing info. You can also get the latest from Woodbine Thoroughbred and Woodbine Standard Bread on Instagram and X. Go to hbibet.com, Dark Horse Bets, and Bet365 for your wagering options. Discover the finest patio experience in Toronto at the Stella Ortois Terrace. Situated on the third floor of Woodbine Racetrack, delight in mouth-watering shared appetizer and raise a toast to the evening. Relish expertly prepared main courses that will tantalize your taste buds. Capture the beauty of sunsets. Indulge in delectable desserts. Secure your reservation today and immerse yourself in the excitement of the races. Enjoy an unparalleled view of the thrilling finish line. Well, it's a special place and uh, the food is great, the atmosphere, it's uh, it's really a, a, a nice experience. Experience the enchantment of Stella Ortois Terrace, open four days a week. Undoubtedly the city's premier patio destination. Rooted in 60 years of tradition, Sleepy Hollow is a private golf club with a friendly community of members just minutes from Toronto. With mature trees and rolling fairways, Sleepy Hollow provides a challenging and enjoyable experience for passionate golfers. Enjoy great golf, amazing dining, and a picturesque patio second to none. Visit SleepyHollowCountryClub.com. Addiction Rehab Toronto, Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center, saving lives, reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life. Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 1-855-787-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. Attention security seekers, ready to take control? Introducing Corporate Protection and Investigative Services, your ultimate solution. Retailers tired of losing profits to theft? Our retail loss prevention experts have you covered. Mobile patrol, close body protection, insured door persons, we've got your security needs covered from all angles. Background investigations and civil recovery programs, trust us for thorough solutions. Licensed by the Ministry of Solicitor General, fully insured and bonded. Visit www.corporateprotection.ca or call 1-800-827-1692 for top-notch security and private investigation services. And we want to thank all the folks who make this show possible. These are friends, trusted business associates, and all-around great folks. We highly recommend them all. Thank you 
for your support of Canadian and local sports. A reminder that the show is available on iTunes, Spotify, Radio Public, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, as well as the Spanglish Network, Zingo TV, and Buzz TV Live. Also, check out the show on YouTube. All our past great shows are on there, as well as some clips. Like and subscribe. It's absolutely free. Thanks once again to Danny Gallagher for being on the program. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Joe Tilly here. My wife, Penny Claire, and I recently took an amazing trip to Egypt and Jordan with Trip Up Hope. And here are our top 10 must-dos. Another must-do experience is a luxurious cruise down the Nile River. The ship was elegantly furnished with premium facilities, including a spacious lounge and a swimming pool. The cabins were comfortable, well-appointed, offering panoramic views of the Nile River and the surrounding landscape. I would highly recommend that you book your next trip through Trip Oppo. Call them today. Brian Gribben Insurance Planning, helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in their early years of retirement without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. Let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family in your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did. 905-686-5678. MNP, a leading Canadian national accounting, tax, and business accounting firm. MNP proudly serves and responds to the need of their clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Through partner-led engagements, MNP provides a collaborative, cost-effective approach to do business and personal strategies to help people and organizations to succeed across the country and around the world. With local offices in Oshawa, Mississauga, Burlington, and more, their team is here to support you. Visit mnp.ca today to learn more. Guests on Joe Tilly Sports receive a gift certificate from Classica Imports, Top of the line, imported men's clothing. Check out the Classica Essential Collection now. Go to shopclassica.com. Do you want to buy or sell a home? Could 31 years of real estate experience help you? Why not speak to an amazing team that loves to overpromise and overdeliver? Aldo has a tremendous team of experts on staff. They are committed to making your next real estate transaction smooth and comfortable. Call 416-GET-ALDO or visit getaldo.com.